Will do. Let's open with a word of prayer. Holy God, we want to thank you for your continued watch care over your people. We are so apt to forget the care that you have for us. Despite our mistakes, our shortcomings and failings, you continue to persevere with us. May each of us follow in your footsteps. In Jesus' name, Amen. <coughs> So, if we have time, I want to give an opportunity for people to ask questions. Um, before we do that, I wanted to share a couple of um, recent news articles with you. which may or may not be significant to you. And I may do some of them uh, as a question and answer so that people can give their thoughts on the comments that are being made by these journalists. I'll, I'll upload them onto the media broadcast after the uh, study. So uh, this one's called Eight Democratic Choices That Paved the Way for Trump's Comeback. This is an opinion piece. I hope you all understand now the difference between an opinion piece and news. Eight mistakes. So I'm going to list them out and then we'll talk about some, if not all of them. So we'll call it eight mistakes. Of the Democrats. One. They ignored warnings from economists. I'll give the whole title. They ignored warnings from liberal economists that their massive new spending would unleash disastrous inflation. So we know that COVID had an impact. We know that the previous administration hadn't left America in a, as good a state as they claimed. But 
But this initiative that Biden, this economic initiative that Biden implemented, has been the cause of this huge inflation spike that we've seen that swept across the world. Number two, I know some of you already found the article, but those who have not, we won't wait for the mic, just shout out what you think the other, what number two might be. The southern border. That's what you just said. And it was a disaster. We would call it the immigration problem that America faces. Number three. Afghanistan. Everybody understands what I mean by Afghanistan? The catastrophic withdrawal from Afghanistan convinced Americans that they were incompetent. They is the Democratic Party. They broke their promise. What promise did they break? You can remember, without looking, going back four years, what was the promise that Biden made? What was his claim to fame, if I can put it that way? He was the great what? We even say in the movement, he was the great, the great compromiser. And that's what he promised America, to compromise, which means to build bridges, to unite America. And not only was he unable to do that? He actually broke his promise and didn't do it. What did they call Trump? What do you call Trump? <laughs> the F word? <laughs> that, that's not good language to build bridges. Another one? <coughs> Biden's cognitive decline. We realize now that that was, that is real. He did and does have a problem And the Democrats weren't willing to be open about it and address the issue. And by the time they are forced to do that, it's too late. And I remember in our movement, people posting articles About what? My brother's bigger than your brother. If you think Biden's old, you should look at 
Trump. And all those arguments have been proven to be fallacious. Six. It's about voters. You can do the French first, we'll do it backwards. No, actually, that doesn't work, forget that. Um, they didn't give voters a benign alternative. What does benign mean? Someone's benign or something is benign. Doesn't mean good. So what is a benign tumor? Okay, yes. So someone over here said harmless. Ask yourself if ask yourself if you agree with this opinion, right? Because this is not news. <laughs> I just run out. The translation is twice as long as my words. It's all good. Um, what's the opposite of benign? Sorry. Ma we go with malignant. So they offered the American voters a malignant alternative. Who did they offer? <laughs> Harris. So they offered the voting public Harris, and this person said the reason they failed. <laughs> is because they should have offered someone who was benign. And our movement was joyful when they offered someone who wasn't benign, Harris. So, if you're looking worried, <laughs> this is an opinion piece. And I'm wondering if you agree with this. Because I've been asking for a while. What does radical mean? And if what we really mean is not radical, but liberal. Oh, I should have done this, sorry. Um, actually, I'll, I'll carry on. I could have shown the article. Um, because earlier, number one was what? Liberal economists. And so what is a liberal economist? It's not someone who throws money away liberally. It's e economists who are uh, economically fiscal, prudent. They're prudent. They're very careful with money. Seven. What was Harris offering the people? They offered continuity. More of the same. And what did America want? They wanted something different. Like 
And the last one is the attacks, the legal attacks on Trump. You have to ask yourself if you agree with Trump or you don't when he said all these indictments were what? Politically motivated. Because the Democrats said nothing to do with us. Biden said the Justice Department does what they want. Got to a, it got to a place where people stopped believing that. So, I don't know what you think about these eight things. The economy went out of control. The southern border went out of control. The withdrawal of Afghanistan was out of control. They did not heal the wound of America. Biden was too old to do his job. They were not given a safe alternative. They offered the same as they had delivered for the past four years. If you go back and check what Harry said, when she became the Democratic nominee, for sure she was more articulate, but she just doubled down on the past four years and said it would be more of the same. And people stopped believing that the attacks on Trump were genuine. I've used the word attack, but it's all the court cases, the indictments that came against him. When you look at those points, I don't know how it makes you feel today, after the election. Compared to how you felt before the election. Every one of these points are topics that have been, we've either been aware of or people have discussed in this movement. Every single one. And I think each of us should take a moment of reflection and ask ourselves were we on the right side or the wrong side of these issues. Or don't we really care about them? Any comments? Any doubling down? Any repentance? <laughs> I don't know what you want to do. <laughs> no comments? Andreas. Um, more like a, a question on what does the person mean when they say it's uh, 
Harris was not benign. So, you know what the word benign means? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, point six. About the issue of a benign alternative to Biden. Or a benign alternative to Trump. And your question is? Because they need to translate your question. The person mean when they say Harris is not benign. What do you know about Harris? In general? In anything? Do you know anything about her? Besides mm. the fact that she's a black woman. Her career as a lawyer. Most most politicians are either ex-military or lawyers. It's, there's nothing unusual about that. You may not know. Just want to make it clear. The person is not saying they should have chosen a white man instead of a black woman. That's not the point they're making. I'll read it, because we should, we should have all known what was being offered, because so many of us seem surprised about the results of the election, because all we were looking for was that there was a woman that was being offered. So I'll just quote what the person says. Unlike Biden... Okay, you need to do the whole sentence or...? Unlike Biden, who, had, who at least had the veneer or the pretense of moderation, That's the compromiser. The Democrats nominated the most radical Democrat, Democratic ticket in the history of the country. What's a radical Democrat? What would we call that? Far left. You said? Liberal. It's someone that's on the very extreme. Most of us don't seem to be aware that Harris was the most extreme offering ever given to the American populace. Maybe you want to fact check that. But if it's so, is it any wonder they wouldn't vote for her? Harris was on record as having supported the democratic socialist agenda. And what's the one that we should all be aware of? <laughs> Not women's rights. The new Green Deal, remember that? The, uh, new, uh, green deal, the new deal, yeah. 
He used to be a Democrat. He's now independent, and I think he's up in Maine. Senator somebody. Sanders. What's Bernie Sanders' sort of like headline claim to fame? What does he want? We should all know that. He wants to tax the rich, but he wants to use that for something. He wants health care for everybody to nationalize the health care system. And everybody says it's crazy. The numbers just won't work. And who supported that? Pardon? Harris. Sorry. In her 2019 campaign, she had pledged to ban what? What is the 2019 campaign? What campaign was that? To become president. She's fighting against whom? Biden. Okay. And she said, if she becomes president, what's she going to ban? Fracking. Could you imagine telling America that you're going to ban fracking? Oil extraction. And she's going to ban the sale of, um, they call it gas, but petrol or diesel, petrol powered cars. Decriminalize what? Not marijuana. <laughs> Illegal border crossings, she would decriminalize that and provide taxpayer funded health care for illegal immigrants. Including, and we say amen to this, transgender surgery. Or it's actually called gender transition surgery. Not for Americans, for illegal immigrants. It's not about the morality of what you think is okay or not okay. But it's the fact that that's the ticket that she stood on only a few years ago. And what was she saying back then? This is the real me. This is what I'm offering. And what does she do just now? On nearly all of those issues. She said, oh, I changed my mind. And we call that fake news <laughs> in the movement, I think. That's why this person says, they could have offered someone a lot less toxic than her. It, it, it go, it, it, it's just such. A, it's just a, uh, it's a travesty, <laughs> what happened. A huge mistake. And I don't think our movement generally is aware of that. We've not looked at American politics objectively. We might claim that we have sifted the news.
I would agree that we have. But we sifted it to the degree that we came to wrong conclusions. Of prophetic events. Any other thoughts? Ignatius. So my <coughs> my question is uh, on the attacks on Trump. So the question is, do we believe that the legal the legal cases against Trump? were politically motivated. A convicted felon. Uh, I understand your question. I understand the question. The point is not whether he was a criminal or not. The Democrats believed, I don't mean to be rude, but you believed that if he were exposed, if these cases went to, went public, What would happen? He would lose credibility in the eyes of the American populace. The Republi Republicans would, would stand and say, that's terrible. We would never vote for such a criminal. And it backfired. It's not about the veracity of the cases. It's about the motivation behind them. <coughs> the idea that it would cripple him instead of strengthening him. That was the point that was being made. So, I want to move on. What's the most significant thing that's happened since the election? In your opinion. It's been over a week and a lot's happened. And in some ways, not much has happened. <coughs> By the way, Biden and Trump have agreed that there's going to be a, a really nice, cordial transition of power. Not going to be any issues. Gabriella. Am I answer your question? Yeah, answer my question, please. The most significant thing that's happened since the election? I think the economic rise, the boom of the... The stock market has yes. gone up. Yes. Tamina? of the world aligning, aligning with Trump having won the presidency. They changed their policies. The ten kings coming together. Anyone else? Got any thoughts? Andres? Um, Trump starting to uh, name his cabinet. The naming of the cabinet. 
So, uh, Man just put his hand up, but I'm going to beat him to it because he's going to say the same thing as me. I think the most significant thing that's happened. Uh, let me get the date correct. Yep. On 7 11, Thursday, Trump called Putin. had a conversation and if you're not familiar with it Putin was ordered I'm going to say to step down ordered to step down. The actual title the actual title of the article isn't that. Trump talked to Putin, told Russian leader not to escalate in Ukraine. You got three options in Ukraine. What are the three options? The three options that the Russians have. Escalate. Keep it the same. Or withdraw. And of the three, Trump says what? Don't escalate. The inference being, before you answer that, I, I said there are three options. Logically speaking, what are the two, because there's only two, that Trump could have, should have offered Putin? What would be the two out, out of those three that he could have said, go for it? Escalate. He rings Putin and he says, escalate. What's the tone of that conversation now? What's Trump saying to Putin if he says escalate? Someone says do what you want. Sorry? Do it if you dare. I think that would have been the tone. If Putin escalates, despite all of the rhetoric, Trump would have to address the issue. He would just have to do that. What's the other alternative he could have said? Withdraw. They're the two obvious ones. Escalate. And see what I'm going to do about it. Or just withdraw. Because if you don't, see what I'm going to do about it. 
But what he says is, don't escalate. And what doesn't he say? He says, he doesn't say withdraw. So what's he saying? Maintain. So he tells Putin to keep the status quo. Without going any more into that article, it's political and prophetic significance. I think that's the most significant thing that's happened. Oh, I wasn't even going to take any questions. <laughs> you wrote oh. 7 11. Yeah. Isn't that before the election? Or I'm. I missed. Oh, okay. uh, was the election on the 5th, I think? Yeah, my bad. Okay, no problem. I normally get things wrong. <laughs> Are you going to comment? A five and a seven. Oh. Um. Was that for uh, Elder Shemaine? Fifth and the seventh. I get better than that. Okay. So, another one I want to share with us. I think we're all familiar with it. Another article. So, Trump speaks to the Senate So, I think we all have a v at least a vague understanding how the American political machinery works All the leading positions, I'm going to call it in the cabinet or the executive branch. No, not the executive branch. We'll call it the cabinet. All the important jobs. The president just can't nominate somebody. They have to... Those nominations have to be rubber stamped or agreed by the Senate. So these are the Senate hearings or the confirmation hearings that you've heard about. So you've all um, watched or listened or read about the, the Senate hearings when they put forth a new Supreme Court judge. So, same issue. And so Trump has spoken to the Senate and he said, let me Trump make the decision. So the term that's used, the legal term that's used, is called recess appointments. Recess means when you have a break. Like when you're at school and you have play or a break in between a meeting. That's a recess. Okay. 
So the definition of a recessed appointment, I'll give a couple of them. In the United States, a recessed appointment, appointment is someone, you know, a head of a department. That's what the appointment is. Is an appointment by the president of a federal official. When the U.S. Senate is in recess, recess means on holiday. So a couple of weeks a year, the Senate goes on holiday. And if someone needs to be appointed, the President can appoint the person while the Senate is on holiday. So hopefully that's clear. The second one gives a little bit more information. This is a loophole, if you know what a loophole is. It's getting around, it's not illegal. It's not illegal, but it's getting around the intent of the law or the issue. There's a, there's a proper way to do things, and if you want to avoid it, you do a loophole. Was that good? Yeah, okay. So I'm going to read the second one. The recess appointments clause authorizing the president to make temporary appointments when the Senate is not in session was adopted by the Constitutional, and it goes on. So, to summarize that, the first two, when Senate is on holiday, and someone has either resigned, uh, retired, been fired. They need to be replaced immediately. The president can appoint someone without getting any permission. But what you see is that it's only temporary. Just there, you can see temporary. When holiday ends and they come back to work, then they have to go through the process and get the person officially appointed. So, the President shall have power to fill up all vacancies that may happen during the recess of the Senate by granting commissions which shall expire at the end of their next session. So I'll just read a portion of this paragraph. When the new president takes office, the Senate's main job is to confirm 
or oppose the people the president nominates to serve in key government roles. So you know that each party, uh, both in the Senate and in the House, has a leader. Who's the current leaders? Does anybody know? No, she's got the casting vote, but I don't think... She may be, actually. The vice president may be. Anyone else? Who's the one for the Republicans? The leader of the Senate. Mitch McConnell? Sorry? Yep. John Toom? Okay. So, when Trump takes the presidency, there'll be um, a new fight, a new vote or whatever, whoever will be the leader of the, the Senate and the House. I think in the UK, that title is not called the leader, it's called the whip. Calling it the whip, you understand what their power is and their abilities. They, they have what's called the party whip, which means there's a party policy and everyone has to follow that um, advice or those rules. Trump has said, whoever wants to be the leader, because I'm so powerful, I, Trump, you won't, you won't get your job without me. I'm only going to give the job, as it says here, that they need to step aside when he gets into office. So they're going to use the recess appointment mechanism so that Trump can appoint all of these people without going through all these Senate hearings. Because the set, because Republicans now have the majority, what's the number they've got? Fifty-three plus plus one. <laughs> so there's fifty-four votes, but the vice president doesn't vote because they've already got the majority. So what he's saying is, whoever he chooses, the Republican senators cannot object. And if they don't object, every person will be voted in. Because the Democrats will never have enough votes. Is this legal? Semi-legal, yes. Because what he will do is either maintain them as temporary appointments or 
or just have um, the Republican senators rubber stamp anything and everything he wants. So that is pretty significant. There will be no objection to all his appointees. Curtis. Why did you add the caveat semi-legal? I, I said semi-legal... Because the recess appointment mechanism is only supposed to be temporary. And Trump has already used that before. And the way they get around it, the, 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 the way they, um, yeah, avoid it, he'll say, I'm going to temporarily appoint this person until I can replace them with someone who's qualified. And he has no intention of doing that. So whilst it's legal, I'm saying it's semi-legal because it's circumventing the rules. That's what he did in uh, his first presidency. When they didn't have both houses. He could just make temporary appointments and then say, I can't fill the permanent job because there's no one qualified that I like. So we yet to see how he goes about doing this exactly. That's the only reason I say it's semi-legal. It's definitely not illegal. But it's not perhaps the spirit of the law. We would call this the work of a dictator, I'm assuming. And it's fully legal or within the system. Which goes back to, I think, some of the points that Curtis was bringing up in his presentations. So, let's have a look at um, some of Trump's picks. As of just before the camp meeting, this is who he had selected so far. Um, let me... Get them all in. Hopefully you can see them. So, who's heard of Susie Wiles? What is the chief of staff? What job is that? One who comes, like, is the person who guards who is coming to see Trump? Okay. If I understand right. Anyone else? You, you, you need the mic or you do not? No? She said no. Curtis? Oh, uh, Blessing? I think it's the person who runs the White House. We'll go with that, simply. It's the person who runs the White House. You never even heard of her, I don't think. She's pretty significant, though. So,
maybe we can just stick to there. Um, abortion rights. Where's abortion rights here? You said I didn't hear what you... Oh, um, yeah. wait, wait, let's get the mic. Uh, health and human services. So we spoke about this issue yesterday. Robert Kennedy. And you know he's not a Republican. Properly. What is he? Was he? He's a Democrat, wasn't he? He didn't, he didn't like the way they operate, so he became an independent. And then he cut a deal and threw his lot in with the Republicans. And he was given this job. What does that tell you? Maybe I've already said it explicitly before. The abortion issue, issue is not a top priority for the federal government. He was a Democrat, he went independent, and now he works for the Republicans. If you know anything about him, I think we already discussed this, what would you identify him politically as? He's a libertarian. And whether you like libertarians or not, because they're like a double-edged sword. One thing about them is they believe in personal liberty. Which is why he's famous for what? Yes, he's not against the science per se. It's all about um, government forcing you to be vaccinated. That's not his only issue, but that's what he has become famous for in recent years. His fight for personal liberty. If you think about it, it's actually quite a wise choice on the part of Trump. J.D. Vance, we all know about. What's he famous for? Sorry? No, he's the first leading politician who has a beard for about a hundred years. It's true. Maybe not that significant, but your answer was better than mine. State. What's the State Department? You have to repeat that, you'll keep on doing it's it too quick. It's like the representation of the United States outside the United States. I like that. Oh. If you hopefully you all got that, I like that answer. Whenever there's a problem anywhere, and the president says, we need to sort that out, we need to talk to that person, They send this person, the Secretary of State is the leading diplomat 
and they and that person is the face of American foreign policy. I want to say, I don't know what you think. Let me say what you. Th let me ask what you think. When you look at these people and you see what job they've been given, I don't know who Trump's advisors are. So we'll just say Trump. Has Trump made wise choices? Good choices. Or are these like crazy? Put your hands up if it, if this is a. Um, I'm going to call it a cabinet. Maybe that's not the right. That's a, a UK term. Is this a wise choice? Put your hands up. Is it a crazy choice? But then why is it crazy? It's crazy for us. Oh. But why is for him? Okay. <laughs> so for those online, most people didn't even vote. And I'm assuming people didn't vote because they're not familiar. I think... This is a really good, I'm going to call it a cabinet, it's not the American term. I think this is a really good cabinet. It's really wise decisions that he's taken here. If you go through each person, it's it's I think it's about half full so far. Each one of them Compared to last time, you see that Trump has learned a lot. He's chosen people who aren't just, you know, his uh, devo devotees. The ones who are in the leading positions are actually competent um, I don't know what to call it. Um, I, I keep using the, the, the English term. Um, they're competent leaders. I was going to say members of parliament, but they're not. <laughs> Anyone want to say something? Tamina. Could we say that last time he was trying to overthrow the system and he has learned to work within the system this time? I think that's a good way of saying it, yes. Okay. Um, when you look through this, you'll see that they haven't done... Um, the economy yet. I guess they're struggling to find someone suitable for that. What's the other big thing? It's not LGBTQ. I know you did. Economy, <laughs> immigration. Where's immigration here? Where's immigration? We all okay with homeland security? Yeah, homeland security is the southern border issue.
and we must all know this politician. No idea? You soon will. <laughs> People haven't heard of her. Hopefully that wasn't, <laughs> that didn't go, <laughs> the audio was lost there perhaps. In person we all heard that, online we, it's not repeatable. Someone tell me what the Attorney General is. Besides Raquel who knows American politics really well. I will answer the question first. What's the Attorney General? Blessing. Uh, the legal representative for the executive branch. The legal rep the legal executive? Yeah, like the chief lawyer for the executive. The branch. chief lawyer. Good. I like that. Curtis? I wanted to comment on, on Matt Gates because he's not favored by moderate Republicans. Stop there. going to talk about working within the system. He's not part of that system for that job. So he's still got some crazy choices in there. In inverted commas. What's your definition of crazy? So if I take... Um, working within the system as being something that's normal. He would be considered an out of the system appointee for that position. He's crazy in that. So I'll read something. Gates is a divisive figure even within his party. I can't see. Uh, page seven. Gates is a divisive figure even within his party. and could face a tough confirmation battle. Except, Trump doesn't want a confirmation <laughs> hearing. So, this is one of the most powerful jobs in the country. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, Explosives. That covers a lot. Explosives. Prisons. DEA, drugs. The Justice Department. FBI. What's the difference between the FBI and the CIA? FBI is in America. CIA is everything outside of America. So this is one of the most powerful jobs in the country. Interior. 
The interior department, what's that? Interior, what's the interior department? You should know because you said before about Harris. Harris was anti... Yeah, okay. Fracking. <laughs> what's the interior department? What would they be in charge of? Not the economy. Anyone? It's basically all the country, the land of America, all the parks, um, all government land, all property. So if they want to run a pipeline from point A to point B, and they want to cut through a nature reserve or someone's farm, this is the person that controls all of that. All the oil licenses. Good? No, it's fine. All the oil licenses are, are dealing with this department. It's a really powerful department. And most of us don't know anything about it. Defence. Why is defence important? Army. What we may not be aware of is that, and I think I alluded to it, that America is now on a war footing. They view the world now at war. You get a presidency that's in a time of peace and a presidency that's in a time of war. That's a war footing. And... So the Defence Secretary is a really critical position. We have mentioned about the CIA. You all know what the EPA is, I presume. To protect people's health. National intelligence. Does anybody know what that is? What's the national intelligence department? Yep, NSA. So it's it's to do with all of the security oversight of the United States. This person, in, she's in charge of that. The official name would be called intelligence. We would call it perhaps spy work. They seem to have a habit of having women as the, uh, the UN rep. I don't know if you've noticed that. And what's another important one that they haven't nominated yet? Education. And this one, why is this famous? Housing and Urban Development. Curtis is your friend, did you say? <laughs> um, he's still on the cards, by the way, <laughs> for, this, for this coming. 
So he might be there. What I wanted us to see here, as this, I'm going to call it a cabinet, the leading positions are all being uh, handed out and um, negotiated. I want us to see how things are the same but very different from the first presidency. This is a leader that has found his footing, he's found his stride. He's elected people that are not only allies, but they're actually competent at doing their job. You may disagree on some of them, but the major ones are pretty conventional choices. And I think each of us should see this gr develop, get to know at least a few of these key people, to understand why they've been chosen and what their agenda is. Because this will tell you what the next two years will look like. Because it's all changing two years, as you know. So, I thought this was a very significant um, article. Significant information that all of us should be aware of. Because this looks completely different to our version of end time prophecy, I think. Does anybody have any questions? Curtis, Tamina. It was just a comment about how in his first term, in Trump's first term, As much as it was chaotic, he didn't really get much done because he filled it with just random people. Whereas now he's got a pretty efficient system in place to get things done. Tamina? In the midterms, we often see a change of power in the legislative power. Um, but we see also the progressive work of gender mandering that the Republicans use it efficiently. you think we can expect again a change in the upcoming midterms or do you think that the Republicans keep on holding the power? I think the gerrymandering issue is a sideshow. It's noise. Gerrymandering. Yeah? Gerrymandering is noise. At the midterms, they will be judged upon only two issues, the economy and the southern border. Uh, 
If they do well, southern border. They will be, I think they'll maintain power. Bless him. Well, I just wanted to say the word cabinet is also used in the US. It is. Good. I was worried. Thank you. <laughs> I, feel I do feel better. I, I, I just want to reiterate the point that was made. When I said this was a wise choice, in my opinion, you may not agree with their politics, but he's, he's assembled a competent team. M many of these people have experience. They're extremely intelligent and they're committed to the cause. That's why I think something unique is happening. Nations. Okay, I have a question. My question is based on the last statement that you said. You say that uh, we can see that Trump's appointments and how things are shaping up. Is going um, against our understanding of end time prophecy. So my question is, why do you say that? My answer to that is going to be, I didn't say that. What I did say, and I may have said it badly, which is my why I may have been misunderstood, that America is on a different agenda. The results of that agenda, I'll use the word may, we could say do, do result in an alignment with what we understand to be the great test. Let me try to put it this way. I may be mistaken, but I think Elder Shemaine said this before, but she may not have. The Ten Kings. Did you mention Ten Kings at all? Okay, someone did. The ten kings are all going to be brought under one king. They shall all come together for one hour, whatever that means. What I'm suggesting, however, you, however we want to conceptualize it, Either the world is divided into two parts. We'll call it Brexit. No, not Brexit. Bricks. V America. Or America V the world. Or America V China. However you want to conceptualize America is fighting against somebody. Some buddies, plural. And I'm suggesting 
the the union of the kings when they all come together speak as one voice is the fulfillment of the war that is currently underway that America is at war with the world however you want to conceptualize that both territorially, economically, culturally. And this cabinet has been created not to subjugate women, but to win World War Three, which is happening on multiple fronts. So it's not just against, in a simplistic way, against our end time prophetic message. I think it's a fulfillment of prophecy. But it doesn't align with the great prophetic test that we understand. And I don't think... It's easy to say, I never thought. But the evidence is already here. That the coming together of the kings. Whether you go to Daniel 2 or Revelation 17. The seventh kingdom. Whoever you want to describe it, they're not coming together over the issue to subjugate women or gender equality. This is about who will rule the world. And the ruling of the world is an economic fight. A, techno a technological fight as much as it is a military one. And that's what this cabinet has been created to address. If that is true, it's as much a prophetic fulfillment as the great test or abortion rights or LGBTQ rights. Our message is multifaceted. And whilst at one level they can all be aligned together, I think the way we do that is much more complicated or sophisticated than we have realized until, I don't mean today right in this study, I mean today after the election. I hope that helps answer your question, yeah? Very last one, because I'm over time. Tamina, sorry. Trump's call to Putin, along with the economic situation of Russia, could we consider this the death of the King of the South? You said that, not me. <laughs> but what I did say was I think this is the most significant event post the election.
take what you mean from that. Until I might say something a bit more. It seems to me the writing's on the wall. If you want an answer to that question, it might be given in Germany in January. <laughs> so sign up <laughs> and it will be done off camera. <laughs> yes. It worked, Amina. On a serious ending, I hope this camp meeting has been all that you hoped that it would be. In person and online. I hope that the messages and the truths, uh, the stories that have come out have been profitable. have helped clarify things for you. So, as we close this camp down, what I want to do is two things. I want to close with prayer now, to close the study, and then I just want to take two minutes of your time because one of our members in Europe, who is gravely ill, has asked that we could collectively come together and to place him before God and to help give him peace and petition on his behalf. So we'll close the study with prayer and then just want to, there will just be another prayer, uh, a prayer of uh, petitioning God to think on our friend. Some of you may or may not know him. If you're online, they're going to try to put him they're going to try and pin him so people online can see him. Let's pray. Holy God, on behalf of all the people listening, attending this meeting, and through this whole camp, we offer you thanks and praise that you have been with us, you have guided our thoughts, our feelings, and that you have continued to unfold important truths to your people. We have many things to learn and to unlearn. May each of us be committed to be diligent students, upright citizens, and faithful disciples. In Jesus' name, Amen.